Hello, I'm Dr. Rostenberg, and I want to personally thank you for checking out my YouTube channel. Stay tuned at the end of the video, and I will give my recipe for your healing process. Now, I wish we could achieve our results with just diet and lifestyle alone, but supplements really do make the difference. And to help you with that, you'll have an opportunity to order supplements at a discounted rate. We'll see you then. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg again from beyondmthfr.com. And today's video is going to highlight an important part of the methylation cycle. We're going to talk about homocysteine. How it hurts our brain is going to be the focus of the next three videos. Um, in our body, the most toxin sensitive, nutrient dependent organ is by far and away our brain. And many of the symptoms people are dealing with in the methylation world, um, including brain fog, anxiety, depression, and other neurological symptoms is just evidence of how much the um, methylation cycle and the toxins are, are impacting our brain. The objective in the next three videos is to discuss in detail the pathways that cause brain inflammation. And what we're gonna find by carefully looking at the research is that it ultimately comes down to the methylation cycle as being the key player in neurological problems and brain inflammation. This is what we're really talking about. This is what the human brain looks like uh, in people who are normal in their age, people who have, have moderate neurological degeneration, and people who have severe. It's haunting to see pictures of the brain with holes in it because my heart goes out to these people and their families because this losing function of the brain doesn't just injure the person whose whose head carries that brain it's a major major problem for the whole family it's expensive it's painful and it's really sad when people lose their mind and by optimizing methylation, we can prevent a lot of this neurological decline. We have to talk about obesity. Not everyone listening to this video has a problem being overweight, but go to the mall and look around. We have a very big problem in our society, and now it's really a worldwide problem of extra fat tissue in our body. And this fat tissue is not silent. Um, fat tissue is part of our endocrine system. So if you triple the size of your thyroid, you're going to have health problems. If you triple the size of your fat tissue stores, you're going to have health problems. And that's because fat tissue releases hormones, many of which are very negative to our brain. So we know that one third of the entire world is now obese. That doesn't include people who are overweight. So uh, we do have a problem on our hands. This is one of the main reasons why. Cheap food is killing us. If you look at this picture, this was a study, or I guess a journal journalism um, study. It wasn't a scientific study, but they had uh, different families all over the world take pictures of what they, they consumed in a week. Here's your average American going to Walmart or some supermarket near their house and you know, this is the food that the average American is eating. This is why methylation problems are getting worse, guys. It's not because all of a sudden we have these genetics. It's because genetics loads the gun and this type of environment pulls the trigger. So there's very few things here on this in this picture that would actually go spoil or go bad if they weren't eaten within six months. We can do a lot better. Recent research revolving around brain health and um, our metabolic health has has made an interesting connection and basically the bigger our waist the smaller our brain so when our uh, when our belly grows and you should know that carrying fat around the belly is due to stress hormone 
cortisol. Cortisol causes the beer belly. It has nothing to do with drinking lager or drinking an IPA. It has everything to do with stress hormones. So when our belly grows, our brain shrinks. The more abdominal fat, especially the visceral fat underneath deep in our body, it correlated with a loss of brain volume. So we need to take our health and our bodies seriously because it doesn't just affect us, it affects everybody. Um, this is another challenging statistic and again my heart goes out to people who are dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's. It's just very, very difficult. Um, we've created a situation in our society that if we live to be 85 years older or older, 85 years or older, which I personally look forward to, we have a 50% chance of losing our mind. And that's because we are not taking good care of our brain as we age. And this is something that I'm going to teach you through these videos why and what we do to fix it. So you're going to be all right. This is more information. This is from the CDC. It just shows you that the Alzheimer's epidemic, we're looking at the last 50 or 60 years of all causes of death. And you can see that up here is heart disease, here's cancer, here's uh, stroke. So when they instituted the idea of, hey, maybe smoking's bad for you, um, heart disease went down and stroke went down a little bit. You can see those lines going down. We haven't really made a dent on cancer, despite all the money and research and et cetera. Um, but you can look at Alzheimer's and realize that, wow, Alzheimer's didn't even exist on the chart before 1980. Well, what changed? Well, the low-fat diet campaigns, high-grain diets, eat your Wheaties, eat your Cheerios, it's good for you, uh, stuff like that. And the statin drugs came out. So people with low cholesterol and low lipids become uh, at higher risk of having neurological problems later in life. This is why in our office we're always looking at cholesterol numbers, not because we're worried about high cholesterol, we're worried about low cholesterol. That's a much bigger problem. Um, most of the dementia that we see is Alzheimer's. Uh, there's other kinds caused by stroke and yet even more still there's a few, you know, uh, less fewer cases of it due to alcohol or Parkinson's or a traumatic brain injury or something like that. So, um, you know, those are the kind of the, the sources of the dementia that we're discussing. But really, it all comes down to homocysteine, guys. Homocysteine is the key player in brain inflammation. And I'm going to show, show you over the course of these next videos why that's, uh, why that's true and what we can do um, to protect ourselves, to balance our homocysteine and nourish our brain. So, you know, homocysteine is the um, byproduct from methionine and SAMe forming, you know, going through the methylation cycle. So it's just the, it's the residue left over after SAMe has donated a methyl group. It's normal, totally, completely, 100% normal to have homocysteine in every cell in your body. We need it, okay? Um, homocysteine is recycled by the MTHFR and the MTR methionine synthase reaction. It's also recycled through the betaine homocysteine methyltransferase BHMT cycle. And it is also, homocysteine is also the, the uh, raw ingredient used to make glutathione. So homocysteine is very important. I'm not suggesting we don't have any. I'm just suggesting we keep it in the right amount. I put this slide together to explain more about homocysteine. Optimum methylation occurs here in the middle. This is when we feel our best. This is when we sleep great. We have energy. If we want to work out, we can work out. We, it gives us energy. We feel good. We can handle stress. Our memory is great. We're learning new things. We feel like life and our health uh, are working well. That's what's happening in the middle of this bell curve. But on the left, you have slow methylation, and on the right, you have slow methylation. And, and you have low homocysteine over here, which is really a more common marker of gross malnutrition. Low homocysteine, I'm talking below 4.0 on a test, on a blood test, is a sign of malnutrition. There's a protein problem in that person's body, and it's not good for you. It is not good, you'll see, to have homocysteine below 4. Over here, we have high homocysteine, much 
much more common. What this means is that you have a micronutrient malnutrition, meaning you're eating enough protein, there's enough protein coming in, but there's not enough of the other support nutrients, the B vitamins, the zinc, the selenium, the cofactors needed to balance your methylation cycle. So I would say on average, the average American is over here. They're too high. They eat food high in energy, high in carbohydrates, high in um, toxic products, low in nutrition. That's the biggest problem. And that creates a lot of methylation demand, a lot of methylation demand without a lot of methyl donors. That slows down methylation. On the other end, it's there's not necessarily a lot of methylation demand here, but there's there's just not enough protein to make homocysteine, not enough methionine, not enough SAMe. Um, it's it's a miserable state really to have low homocysteine. Um, this is what someone might look like who has low homocysteine. They're malnourished. They're protein starved. And when we look into um, other diseases such as you know kidney failure or other chronic conditions, you know, the research has always tended to say high homocysteine is a risk factor, and it is. Don't get me wrong, it is. But when patients are hospitalized and their homocysteine starts to drop, that's actually worse because it means they don't even, they're not getting enough protein into their body in the hospital. They're not getting enough nutrition to fight this thing off, to restore themselves. So the relative risk of death for the lowest homocysteine was 220 percent okay so there's a lot there's a much much greater um, you know chance of dying in the hospital if your homocysteine is low than if it's mid than if it's adequate okay so not to focus too much on the negative you should just know low homocysteine not good and that begs the question what is a good homocysteine level a great question. This study uh, was published by Metametrics, a uh, very uh, high quality functional medicine laboratory, and they looked at 1,400 cases in 2004 between January and March. And they averaged it out. They plotted a curve of all the different levels of homocysteine that were coming through. And what they're looking at is a change in, in the shape of the curve, and they, de they determined that between four and eight is the optimum level of homocysteine and I'm I'm on board with that that's a great um, it's scientifically valid 1400 people is a great uh, size of a study um, so low homocysteine bad below 4 high homocysteine you know above 8 certainly above 10 12 up here into the, the teens you've got your, you have a methylation problem likely becoming a methylation emergency at that time so that's really what low homocysteine and high homocysteine is if you're looking at your blood test, you want to see it between 4 and 8. We're going to touch on this briefly and follow up much more detailed on our next uh, video. But basically, this is a kind of uh, inverted uh, chart of the methylation cycle. This is methionine synthase, MTR. You're looking over here at uh, the SAMe donation pathway. Here's methionine. And what you notice is when there is oxidative stress, when the cell becomes threatened with uh, biochemical challenges, oxidation, inflammation, it shuts off methionine synthase and it shuts off the production of taurine. Okay, It's driving all the homocysteine down into glutathione that it possibly can. This is a survival mechanism built into every single cell in our body. Um, despite our SNPs, despite what genetics, whether CBS is upregulated or downregulated, whether we have MTHFR genetics, whether we have other methylation imbalances, despite those genetic SNPs, this process I'm showing you here is fundamental. It's how our body's programmed. Our body is programmed to make glutathione in the face of inflammation, and this is how it works. It takes homocysteine it shuts down methylation because it's not there, your body's not going to invest resources in methylating something when if when it needs to put a fire out. So when a fire starts inside of a cell, all of the day-to-day -day activities that make the cell feel good shut down until the fire is put out. It's a crisis, and your body's very very well adapted to deal with crisis. The problem is a crisis that never ends will slowly erode our health and that's what we do in our office is we figure out how do we help people through the put the fire out and get out get out of a crisis uh, 
situation with their body. So you're looking at where homocysteine gets pushed into cysteine and then glutathione, and that's a great thing that our body does. It saves our saves our tail when we have uh, a lot of inflammation going on, a lot of challenges, heavy metals, things like that. Um, but it does affect our attention. When you reduce methylation inside the brain and you slow methylation down, you actually slow down the ability for neurotransmitters to stimulate your brain. So this is brain fog, guys. This is inflammation, slowing down methylation, giving you brain fog. You can't focus. You're going to have uh, kids and adults with ADD and, and OCD and they can't stay focused on a task more than five minutes and that's a really common complaint. Well, you're looking at manifestations of imbalances in the neurologic system due to methylation and homocysteine plays a role. And your body will make as much glutathione as it absolutely can until all the cofactors are exhausted. So we'll talk more about that next time. So for those of you listening, thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions about what I've touched on in this video, please reach out, uh, shoot us an email, or just leave a comment on the blog. But stay tuned for parts two and three. And homocysteine is a big topic, and homocysteine and MTHFR are going to be uh, something we're going to cover in detail. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Rostenberg again from BeyondMTHFR.com, and today's video is a follow-up to our previous video on homocysteine, how it hurts the brain, and really how it acts as a toxin inside every cell of our body. And we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We're going to touch on the bell curve, the homocysteine bell curve, which is just a graphical representation of where we want to be. Our goal with our health is to be in the optimum methylation area between four and eight on a blood test. A few people out there watching will have low homocysteine before below four and that is more of a frank uh, protein malnutrition state. That is slow methylation simply because there's not enough methionine not enough protein coming in to allow the system to 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 methylate at a, at a decent speed. For the rest of the video today, we're going to be focusing more on patients with high homocysteine levels. This is a bigger problem in our uh, modern Western society, and really, we're talking about the effects of toxins, an overabundance of toxins, combining with people who are considered an overconsumption, undernourished phenotype. This is the another way to discuss the metabolic syndrome, the the overweight, um, you know, high blood pressure, elevated risk of cancer, heart disease, stroke, and depression. This is really all due to high homocysteine levels, and we're going to explain in detail how that works. So moving on, we look at this uh, research. Uh, excerpt from 2012. It does a good job of explaining how homocysteine slows down methylation all over the body. And what you're really looking at is how oxidative stress in any form, we're talking about here high fructose corn syrup, which is pretty toxic uh, stuff. It's got mercury in it. We're looking at organic, um, you know, organic pesticides. Uh, we're looking at heavy metals, we're looking at BPA, we're looking at DDT, we're looking at uh, hormones like birth control even, um, and, and certainly uh, fabric, uh, flame retardants, and other chemicals that are just in our environment. Stuff that we've created that uh, is causes inflammation in our body. Any of these substances will cause the cell to react. And, and when the cell comes into contact with inflammation, with things that oxidize it, it triggers a, a, a response to increase glutathione. Glutathione is the ultimate cellular fire extinguisher. There's nothing our body uses more than glutathione to put out oxidative stress. So glutathione is the number one antioxidant in the cells of our body. And it is made from homocysteine. So there we have the connection between an elevated homocysteine level and glutathione, meaning that it's 
in an intelligent response by the body to increase homocysteine in the face of inflammation because homocysteine allows the body to make more glutathione. But the negative effect of that on the cellular methylation cycle is that as homocysteine increases in response to oxidative stress so that the body can make more glutathione, that shuts down methionine synthase, the NTR. You don't, know, you don't have to have a SNP on your report for this to happen. This happens because of epigenetic signaling. It's, it's above the gene, not the gene itself. So regardless of whether you have a SNP or not, high homocysteine will slow down the methionine synthase enzyme. If you have a SNP, it's probably going to be a little more, uh, a little worse for you, but it can happen to anyone. And the reason why is the body's conserving homocysteine. It's not going to recycle it through NTR when it needs it to make glutathione. That is the key point here. Now when we look at what else uh, homocysteine does in terms of causing problems elsewhere in the body, giving us uh, ultimately disease states, we are going to talk first about nitric oxide. And nitric oxide, like this giant pipe here, it, it opens up our blood vessels and allows blood to flow. That's why nitric oxide is critical for uh, brain health, you know, like erectile function, cardiovascular health, anything where we need to move blood around our body effectively, nitric oxide is playing a role. It allows our blood vessels to stay open. Unfortunately, when homocysteine levels build up, it causes an increase in a molecule called asymmetric dimethyl arginine, ADMA. So ADMA binds very, very tightly to nitric oxide synthase. On your genetic report, it's binding to the NOS NOS genes. When ADMA is high, it doesn't matter if you have a SNP or not. ADMA will bind to NOS and really make it difficult for your body to make nitric oxide, the good kind. And it will, in turn, cause an increase in the reactive forms of oxygen. This is going to be familiar to some of you as peroxynitrite. That's basically what um, ADMA increases peroxynitrite, it, it uncouples NOS. So that's one of the f ways that homocysteine levels, when they're elevated, uh, impacts our health. Looking now more at the brain, a study was done just this year that basically determined that when someone has a stroke, if they have higher homocysteine, and in this study they say high levels are above 10.3. We're saying high levels are above 8. I believe our numbers are more correct. But again, this research is getting closer to the functional, uh, you know, what a high homocysteine level actually is. So high levels of homocysteine greater than 10.3 were increasing the risk of someone suffering a stroke having much worse uh, side effects from that stroke. In other words, high homocysteine at the time of a stroke increases the neurological degeneration by 250 percent. What you need to know of, of this study is if you're already inflamed and if your brain is already have has uh, toxic metabolic products in there, if something were to happen like a stroke, the damage will be worse. The flip side is if we nourish ourselves with uh, good antioxidants and we lower homocysteine levels, then should something like a stroke happen, we will add, in fact recover from it better. This is another study uh, recently published in 2013 talking about how homocysteine damages our hippocampus, which is our memory. It's, our, um, it's where we store our long-term memories of who we are, who the people in our life are, and I'm, I'm really talking here about dementia. So you can see here in this, this picture as an example, this is a fully healthy sized hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is degenerating along with a lot of other white matter uh, around it. So homocysteine plays a very big role in the destruction of brain tissue over time. So we want to protect our neurologic systems by optimizing our homocysteine by optimizing methylation, which is just you know the whole reason for this project. So here we have evidence that uh, homocysteine basically changes the electrophysiological properties and that's a fancy word of saying neurons don't fire right when they're inflamed and homocysteine is a big player in that inflammation.
looking at some other studies here as uh, looking at some other effects of high homocysteine, one, one other negative side effect of elevated homocysteine levels in the body is it begins to interact with proteins. And what they're saying in this study is that homocysteine involves cysteine modification, meaning it's when your homocysteine levels are high, that means the cell is filling up with homocysteine and now it's spilling into the blood so you can see it on a blood test. It's starting to interfere with connective tissue and it's weakening it. And this is, this is the Marfan phenotype. This is an example um, of someone who has a weakened arterial wall. And this is really common in Marfan syndrome and Marfan syndrome is also associated with a very slow CBS which causes a very high homocysteine. And so by studying Marfans, we can study what homocysteine does, and that's exactly what this shows. High homocysteine interferes with maintenance of the elastic fibers in the skin, lungs, and the aorta. In other words, high homocysteine levels in your body over long periods of time will make your connective tissue weaker. The people with Marfan's disease, or Marfan syndrome, excuse me, suffer because it weakens the aortic uh, artery here, and this is sus uh, susceptible to bursting. This is why these basketball players are very tall, lanky uh, build, and they're out playing basketball in the finals, and in the third quarter they collapse on the court because they lost all the blood in their body because of their aorta burst. It's a tragedy, but it's caused by homocysteine. Homocysteine weakens the wall of the aorta. It's under pressure. It slowly turns into an aneurysm, and then it has a susceptibility to burst. I'm not saying this to keep you up at night. I'm just saying here is what high homocysteine levels do to connective tissue. It weakens the elastic fibers. This study caught my attention because it was a very good explanation of how homocysteine levels not only shut off methylation, but it changes the cholesterol levels in our blood. It changes the membrane, the health of the membrane of the cell. So what you need to pay attention to here are the red arrows. Homocysteine increases. It inhibits adenosyl homocysteine, or it, it doesn't inhibit it, but it increases the levels of adenosyl homocysteine. That inhibits all the methylation transferase reactions in your whole body. High homocysteine pushes the reaction back towards adenosyl homocysteine, and that shuts off all the 150 different methylation reactions in your body. What you need to know then is that you stop making choline. The PEMT enzyme is shut off. Then you start to accumulate saturated fatty acids, saturated fats in the membrane of all the cell material. That starts to cause other problems and it creates a biochemical cascade where um, the cell can no longer function at its best. Okay, it's the, the membrane of the cell wall. The takeaway from this study is that when your homocysteine levels rise, you're, going, you're more likely to have saturated fat built into the cell. And saturated fat is more like plastic. It doesn't breathe as well, it's not as fluid, and it doesn't send and receive signals as well. So high homocysteine is one of the causes of having uh, poor cell membrane health. And when the cell membrane is full of saturated fats, the cholesterol that's usually in your cell membrane goes into your bloodstream. And the reason why is when we have lots of good fish oil in our, in our cell wall, the cell wall is very fluid and the cholesterol helps to stabilize it. But if your cell is made out of saturated fats, you don't need the cholesterol in there anymore and so it gets pushed into your bloodstream a la higher cholesterol. So I'm, I'm just sharing this with you. There's more to say about this in future videos, but it is basically, um, it causes endoreplasmic endoplasmic reticulum stress, ER stress. That's what homocysteine does and it's known to cause liver disease as well as atherosclerosis and that has to do with blood sugar in this next slide. So just building off the slide we just showed you previously, ER stress from high homocysteine plays a critical role in type 2 diabetes. What you need to know is when homocysteine levels rise the cell wall, the membrane of the cell, becomes less fluid and it doesn't listen to the insulin signal as much. Okay? When the cells ignore insulin, we become insulin resistant. 
that is the foundation of type 2 diabetes. So this is how it works. High, high homocysteine inhibits insulin sensitivity in fat tissue through endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum stress. The cure, guys, is to get your homocysteine levels in balance and do the healthy things that we discuss here on Beyond MDHFR and in the functional medicine world. That's how we, we overcome this. But this is just good information to show you that homocysteine is, uh, is pretty, pretty devious and mischievous. It's playing a role in diabetes as well. Um, inflammation uh, shrinks the brain. So brain atrophy, the loss of brain mass, is observed in 20 to 50 percent of patients with epilepsy. And again, my heart goes out to people who have dealt with this. I have patients who have gone through this uh, process. It's not, uh, it's a very, very stressful disorder. But what the research says is there is a link between seizures, oxidative stress, and homocysteine. Patients with epilepsy need to get their methylation cycle balanced as much as anyone. And it will maintain the mass of their brain and just give them a better shot at being healthy. One more uh, research snippet here before we close for today. This is just another example demonstrating that from the Parkinson's disease research that the inflammation caused by homocysteine over time creates a situation where the size of the brain literally shrinks, as I just showed you. And this is a graphical representation between a healthy age-matched brain and one with Alzheimer's. And as I mentioned in part one, Alzheimer's is now the sixth leading cause of death in the United States and it's not a pleasant, easy, quick way to pass on. And it can be, a, it can be prevented and improved by using this uh, science of uh, methylation and functional medicine. So that's why we're talking about it. Homocysteine levels significantly correlate with loss of uh, memory, cognitive ability, and neurodegeneration. And, and that's something that we all need to pay attention to. So I hope you found this video int uh, useful and interesting. Uh, please reach out with any questions or comments you can post on the blog at mthf beyond mthfr.com and as always uh, thanks for your time and attention and we will see you again soon good afternoon everyone this is dr rostenberg again from beyond mthfr.com this video is the final video in the how homocysteine harms the brain series relating mthfr and homocysteine and what I want to start with today is giving you some information about how to figure out if someone has a problem just by looking at them as a as a doctor or a chiropractor working in my clinic on a daily basis I see people touch patients I spend a lot of time looking at people and certain patterns begin to emerge I want to share these two case studies with you I'm sorry if you have an aversion to feet but uh, these are good examples of brain problems that show up on the outside of the body. On the top part of your screen here, you're looking at the feet of a 75-year-old male with a history of multiple, multiple uh, transient ischemic attacks, many strokes. Um, his chief complaint, uh, mainly re related to me by his wife, uh, is that of confusion, memory loss, and balance. They literally had to carry this individual into my office where after treatment he was able to walk out. But uh, during the exam you can see how just how dry and cracked his feet are. Now I, these, these photos really don't do it justice but these are some of the driest uh, skin and driest feet that I have ever seen. On the bottom of your screen is another individual a 62 year old male with a history of basically head and neck injuries. Um, this individual is now disabled and due to the effects of some form of Parkinson's like dementia. And what I want to, um, chronic, you know, traumatic encephalitis is another uh, issue this gentleman has dealt with, but look at his toes. Now, the only way your toes can turn that color and change is that the circulation has been removed. Is, is inhibited. There is no circulation going on in these toes, certainly not enough to allow the immune system to do its job. And so what you notice is if you can look at the feet, you're getting a preview of what's going on in the brain. 
And the reason why is the feet are like the tip of a leaf. And when a leaf is a plant is stressed or there's a problem with the nutrition of the plant, the plant gets dry from the tip of the leaf. And then it works towards the, the trunk or the stem. And it's the same with our body. If you see dryness or changes in the toes, and again, he has very dry skin in his feet as well. What that means is, is that there is not enough essential fats in this individual's body. The same is true for both of these people. So the reason I'm showing you these slides of the feet is when you see really dry feet, cracked, lack of moisture, it's a omega-3 and essential fatty acid problem. And you can take it to the bank that if you see this kind of a problem on the feet, you also have that problem in the brain. These two individuals happen to both have established neurological deterioration, neurological problems, and they also have very, very dry, cracked feet. This uh, person here on the bottom with the toenail fungus, where there is no circulation, there's low oxygen, and yeast grows, fungus grows in the absence of oxygen. This is how we make alcohol. We put sugars in a barrel and seal off all the light in the air and the sugars turn it in the yeast turns it into alcohol so this is a well-known process and the reason I'm talking about this guy's toenails is when the toenails are this um, sort of deteriorated due to fungus you know that there's been poor circulation in his toes and you know there's been poor circulation in his brain so these are two things to pay attention to when you look at yourself and neighbors and friends when you're out at the barbecue this summer. Just, hey, take a look at their feet. It will tell you a lot about their brain. This is a review slide from the last two videos talking about the homocysteine bell curve. The point of this slide is just to illustrate that health is all about balance. On the left side and the right side, we have imbalance, we have disease, we have uh, you know loss of function. The rest of this slideshow is really going to talk about the high homocysteine phenotype, the high homocysteine person. In our society, we are much more likely with our high rates of diabetes and heart disease and metabolic syndrome and overconsumption, eating fast food and things like that, to have high homocysteine than we are to have low. So we're kind of over here on the high homocysteine side. Methylation pathways are screwed up because... Uh, they're, all the methyl donors are being used up trying to deal with this high homocysteine load. Those of you watching who are testing your genetics, I wanted to show this to you. Um, this is a hybrid from several people's tests. This isn't one individual. This would be a very tough case if someone did have all these SNPs. But these are the SNPs most commonly uh, associated with high homocysteine. These are the SNPs that genetically can interfere, interfere with the recycling of homocysteine. Okay, So you're looking at MTHFR and associated pathways here. We're looking at MTRR, MTR, BHNT, PEMT, and AHCY. And, I, and you can read the blog post and get a little more info on those, but these are the ones most directly responsible for high homocysteine levels. By, certainly by no means the only ones responsible, but these are the main ones. Methylation nutrients will help lower homocysteine. That is a fact. We're going to go over that here shortly. Um, I just want to review that you know brain inflammation is really what we're talking about. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. And 35 years ago, it didn't exist, hardly at all. So something's changed. I'm suggesting it's a methylation problem due to all the toxins, all the malnutrition and all the stress that we are under collectively and the reason we focus so much on gut health in our office and other practitioners do as well is that it creates brain inflammation so anything anytime we have a leaky gut our gut immune system makes these red molecules that go into your bloodstream your heart pumps them all over your body and they end up in the brain they create inflammation they steal your tryptophan so you can't sleep and then they make more glutamate so you're neurotoxic you don't feel good, anxious, restless, um, you know, all kinds of symptoms, rage, depression, ringing in the ears, tingling and numbness, lots of different symptoms associated with this. So getting the gut right causes the immune system to calm down and send calming blue signals into the system, into the brain. They actually make you smarter. They increase something called brain-derived 
neurotrophic factor, which is science speak for making new synapses, making new connections. And uh, that's what we're going to promote. That's what we're, we're going to help you do that. This is the slide that just shows again from the CDC using their own data that Alzheimer's disease is the number sixth leading cause of death. And look at that curve, guys. It didn't exist back here. Low fat diets, cholesterol is bad, butter is bad, red meat and fat is bad, and statin drugs are good. And get that out into the population as much as we can. And all we do is we just destroy our brains. So, you know, there's ways we, there's ways we can age in a healthy way, and that's what we're going to talk about, and that's what we promote at beyondmthfr.com and certainly in my clinic. Um, but this just shows you that Alzheimer's disease and brain problems are a growing problem, and we want to get in front of that. This is just a little bit of science to kind of highlight the idea of what depression really is. And depression doesn't mean you want to listen to you know angry or sad music and paint in the color blue. And depression just means decreased brain activity. No more, no less. Don't overcomplicate it. That's all depression means, especially from a neurologic point of view. These are two two MRIs showing you know a depressed brain and an and a non depressed. Well, the difference is simply the level of activation. Inflammation, like I showed you in the slide a few slides back, the gut inflammation underpins the development of depression. It steals your tryptophan, so you can't make serotonin and you can't make uh, niacin very much. Uh, it causes anxiogenic effects, which is a fancy way to say it causes anxiety, and it's neurotoxic. So this is what inflammation does. At the root of this low-acting brain, the difference between this brain and this brain is the person on the left is really inflamed. And there's lots of things we can do to help that. And homocysteine, lowering homocysteine is, is a critical part of any program to lower inflammation. Um, it just helps so many things. This is a slide showing epilepsy, um, how epilepsy is related to inflammation. Again, a normal individual has more activation in their brain than an epileptic does. So we're seeing all these syndromes like ADD, ADHD, depression, anxiety, epilepsy, Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's is a loss of brain function. Again, inflammatory and immune system molecules start seizures and promote seizures. This is what we're affecting by controlling homocysteine. I love this slide because it basically says exactly what the natural medicine world has been saying a long time. Vitamins protect the brain. It's no more complicated than that. Um, the difference between, in this study, basically the, the difference between people who had homocysteine related problems and those who didn't depended on how many antioxidants and methyl groups they had in their body. I mean, it's just that's why supplementation is so important. Getting the right ones for your body can be challenging, and that's what doctors like myself and other clinicians can help you do. Every color, every day, all the colors in these foods are antioxidants, different chemicals. And again, they're saying basically that brain damage and neurodegeneration is prevented by using antioxidants that we take in our diet and antioxidants like glutathione that we make. Um, it's always better to make glutathione inside your body than to take it in a pill because you make it in every cell of your body. So we can create situations where the body just makes all the glutathione it needs if you give it the right ingredients and you don't have to spend extra money on a glutathione supplement that may or may not be um, effective. More research. Basically, it's all about methyl groups, guys. This is why methylation is so, so powerful and so important. Um, again, folate comes from the word foliage because folate was found in green leafy vegetables. In our society, we just don't eat enough green leafy vegetables. We're all guilty of that. Um, eating all these vegetables in perfect, pristine, 100% healthy soil would probably lower the need for us to take supplements. But until that day comes, I... And I hope you take the right kind of methyl support and supplements that you need to optimize you, your body and your brain. And, you know, basically, SAM, a methyl donor, or SAM precursors, folate, B12, ameliorate, fix neurotoxicity. 
Okay, it's great. Uh, these methyl groups really do make a difference. Um, they do protect our brain and our neurologic function. Another uh, favorite study of mine came out last year. It shows basically that B vitamins lower homocysteine and that leads to a decrease in the loss of gray matter. Well, if you lower inflammation by lowering homocysteine, you actually preserve the health and the size of the brain as we age. It's just that simple, guys. Vitamins, supplements are just concentrated food. It's just getting more folate in a pill because it's hard to eat 10 pounds of lettuce. Um, eat your, all the lettuce you can and whatever you're lacking after that, then you add supplements on top. That's a winning formula. Um, so I just share this with you because just to, just to show, just to prove how efficacious and how specific methylation nutrition is to protecting your brain and helping you optimize your neurologic function. Um, if you're the type of patient who's reacting poorly to methylation vitamins, that is the subject of another series of videos called MTHFR and the Stress Gut Connection. Uh, look for that on my website as well, on the blog. I just want to show you this one more time. Keep this in your files. Cracked skin on the hands and feet. Infected toes, poor circulation in the toes, really low quality fats inside this person's body. And they're drying out from the extremity toward the core. That's why the bottom of the feet and the hands get dry first. You can take it to the bank. If you see this type of cracked skin on someone's feet and this type of toe pattern, they've had low circulation in their toes and low circulation in their brain for a long time. And they've also become very deficient on the essential fats that make our brain work. So these people, these individuals need to get high doses of the right kind of fish oil in their body and when they do they they improve. It's really fun to be a part of that. Looking at the SNPs one more time, homocysteine is the result of multiple factors but the genes that mostly impact them are listed here. These are the most direct impact into the homocysteine levels in our body. It's how fast we recycle folate, how fast we recycle uh, betaine, homocysteine, methyltransferase. These are the pathways, the primary and the secondary homocysteine pathways that uh, sometimes when they're not working well, our homocysteine rises too high, causing lots of neurological problems. So thanks again for your time and attention. I appreciate all your questions and comments. Um, you know, this is uh, the work that we do. We help people optimize their genes so you can optimize your life and there's more to come so please stay tuned and uh, thank you again for your time and attention thank you so much for watching this video and sharing it with your friends and family i personally believe as i'm sure you do as well that educating ourselves about what it truly means to be healthy is the only way we're going to change healthcare. i have created a website as a resource for you to take advantage of this information Navigate to www.beyondmthfr.com and take a look around. In addition to blogs and articles I have written, you will find a tab on the menu labeled Protocols. It is a growing list of tools that I use in my office to help support my patients. You will find background information on common health conditions. You will find a detailed supplement protocol and you will find dietary advice to support the body's natural healing process. You will also have access to order recommended supplements at a discounted rate and have them shipped to your front door. I'm giving you the tools that I use and practice every day to help you overcome health challenges and live a happier, healthier life. I have done my best to give you that information and you will find it on these protocol pages. If you are looking for more help, then simply what supplements should, should you take or what diet should you follow. I'm encouraging you, I'm inviting you to come to Boise and see me. Let me and my team and my staff take care of you. We have patients coming from all over the country and all over the area on a regular basis and there's room for you too. Now if coming all this way to Boise is too big of a commitment, then please pick up the phone or email my office. We can work together from a distance.